Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't know if I should talk a little or if we should do questions or whatever it's for. I mean, um, I really got into photographing civil rights uh, through James Baldwin. I was doing stories for Life magazine and uh, I asked Life and I asked uh, uh, Jimmy things. Um, whether I could do an essay on him, which I did, and uh, we then traveled for three or four weeks throughout. Uh, we started in Harlem and we went to Durham, North Carolina. We spent a lot of time in Mississippi. We went to New Orleans. And that really got me started uh, and really opened my eyes to a lot of things that uh, I was not that aware of. I had lived in New York which had a slightly different climate. Um, in, in some ways, uh, the South might have been even more civilized in terms of, in terms of its strange structure. You know, you, you basically had a culture where people had brought, been brought up in two different ways and where one part of the culture was uh, reacting and tendency towards a violent way to maintain it, the structure that it had before and um, another group very much motivated by church and nonviolence uh, decided that there had to be a change in representation in terms of voting which was the only way that you could change the whole system. Uh, with life I, I, I worked, I did a lot of things, I, I was the first person uh, I guess a press or anything like that uh, to come into Philadelphia, Mississippi after the civil rights workers had been uh, killed and um, I started taking pictures and there was this big burly sheriff there and uh, I started taking pictures of him and um, he came over to me and he took the camera out of my hands he opened the back of the camera, pulled out the film, threw it on the ground and handed me back my camera and probably if I wasn't working for life and uh, didn't have a stringer who had, uh, I guess, been to Old Miss, um, I might have been in a lot of trouble. When I first started working with um, this guy, uh, it was in Jackson, Mississippi, and he took one look at me, so I had this leather jacket and my long hair and all, and um, he pulled me into a barber shop and he told them that I had lost a bet and that they should give me a marine haircut, which they did. And then he got a red alligator shirt for me to wear and white corduroy pants and it was just a radio case in which to put my camera. And then he felt he could go out on the street with me. Um, Basically, I, 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 I learned a lot and uh, uh, had quite a number of experiences uh, throughout, throughout the, the areas. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in Mississippi. Uh, one time I was with uh, Baldwin and uh, we visited Medgar Evers house and uh, as a joke we put a, a towel over our license plate, which was really a joke because they had been watching us and they knew our license and all of that. But uh, uh, I guess the only time I really hit it to prejudice was uh, when I was um, with uh, James Meredith and, and uh, James Baldwin at Meredith's house and uh, they decided to go out for dinner and they felt they couldn't take me with them. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, did you, uh, how did you first get inspired to, to, to develop that kind of relationship with the, uh, the black community? Um, basically, I've always had a liberal turn of mind and, um, you know, a, a sense of, of what was right or, or what should be right. Uh, what I heard, I lived in New York, uh, what I heard that was going on was, was not terrific. Um, and also, it was really important in terms of news and situation like that. And I started working for Life Magazine uh, 
as an adolescent, I had decided to become a journalist, and the most that you could really aspire to was being a Life magazine photographer, as far as I saw it. So I first started doing my own essays. I went to uh, Arkansas, and I spent three, three weeks uh, at a migrant workers' camp and did a series of pictures there. Uh, and I brought that back, and there was a small Catholic magazine called Jubilee, and they published an eight-page portfolio, which was really the first portfolio I'd ever had. And the New York Times picked up one of the pictures and used it as a cover for the New York Times magazine section. And I did a thing on narcotics addiction in East Harlem and things like that, things which I, I really thought were emotional and important. And gradually, uh, life finally hired me, and I, I did a lot of work for them and for other magazines. So that's how I, I got started, and then it was a question of really um, doing a, a wide circuit of, of stories, and certainly civil rights was uh, a predominantly important thing to do with. Did you, uh, did, you, did you study music along the way? No, I don't have a good music sense, I mean, which is strange. Both my wife and son are very, very into music, and I'm not as much into music, which is weird, but it's true. I guess I'm more visual in terms of everything. It would help if I was more musical. Thank you very much. I did see the narcotic addiction piece, which was a, which was huh? a beautiful, then the piece on narcotic addiction, yeah. which was a, which was a beautiful <coughs> message with that. You're amazing, actually. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about the relationship with James Baldwin, you know, because he was really a firebrand. James you know? Baldwin was very important in yes. terms of civil rights, and his importance has never been recognized right, in the right. full sense. There seems to be a renaissance. I, um, I had dinner with Lonnie Bush, Bunch, who is the going is director of the new uh, African American Museum, which will open in a year, and uh, his favorite author is Baldwin, and most of the people at the museum, Baldwin is their favorite author. Uh, Baldwin had a meeting uh, along with um, uh, Belafonte and uh, a few other people that uh, Bobby Kennedy came to, and this is earlier, in 1963. And uh, I think Bobby had come to this meeting with the idea that everyone was going to say, oh, the Kennedys are really doing great in terms of civil rights. And he didn't get that reaction. And James uh, uh, um, one of the people there, uh, Jerome Smith, one of the original Freedom Riders, you know, said in the middle of the meeting, this meeting nauseates me. So Bobby went back to uh, the president and said, hey, I don't think we have the vote in our hands. You know, and it was a, a major change in terms of the Kennedy attitude towards civil rights in America. And uh, there's, a, there's a picture, I'm doing a book now, which is, is really, uh, it will be a book which uh, will have the essay that uh, Baldwin wrote, uh, The Fire Next Time, pictures I took of him, but also a, a large spread of civil rights pictures. And um, uh, the last picture in the book, as I see it, is a picture of Baldwin uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. And he, he's standing there uh, just smiling, and you, you see uh, um, all these people really like applauding him, uh, all these civil rights leaders applauding him, and you know, he really was recognized as, as being an, an important element in everything. An extremely smart person, but erratic. I mean, oh, always on the edge of <clears throat> something, you know, um, very lonely, uh, you know, drank a lot. You know, we, we never made a plane by more than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, just an amazing person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah? Are your memories of that time uh, totally integrated with the pictures that you were making? Or are your memories of that time kind of separate? Do you remember the time through the pictures? Or do you remember your personal experiences more? 
I, I remember a lot of it. Um, I, I don't have the best memory in the world, but uh, I remember a lot of it. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really fun for me to go through everything. The, the funny thing is that um, a good part of the pictures in this room have never been published before. This is the first time this picture has ever been printed. This is the first time that picture has ever been printed. There's never been a print of it. Uh, the same with that. These, these pictures were never edited. In a strange way, what happened with life is you would photograph and your film would be sent by American Airlines overnight and the Life Lab would process it the next day and you just, you know, kept going from one place to another, so you really never even saw what was happening. But the editor at Life used to clip in the sprocket holes the pictures that they felt were worth editing. This picture was never edited, that picture was never edited. Um, that one might have been. Uh, but for the most part, um, the pictures were, were never edited. There's another funny thing, by the way, in terms of this picture, which is that this is this week's right. New Yorker. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Super. So when life closed, did they give you back your film? Uh, yeah, well, I never was. I never was an actual staff member of life. I kept going up to life and saying, "Well, why don't you put me on the staff?" Because again, you know, as a teenager, I really wanted to be a life photographer. You know, and that was my big ambition. And uh, they'd say, "No, no, you're doing okay." You know, and actually, I was working because I looked like I was 12 years old. Uh, everyone thought I was adorable, and all the, all the departments of life wanted to work with me, so I was actually working more than most of the staff people. <laughs> but they never would put me on the staff, and actually that worked out really well. Yes, I have all the negatives. <laughs> How did your parents feel about that level of engagement that you had? I don't, think my, I don't think my parents were into any of it, really. You know, uh, um, uh, I think we lived in two different worlds in a way. I, I don't think they had as much an interest in current events or what was happening. It wasn't like, you know, an activist family or something mm -hmm. like that, which a lot of people have had and, you know, which creates a background in your family for, you know, for what's right or whatever. Um, but uh, I, I was fairly independent as I grew up, um, and pretty much on my own, in a way. Is most of your work done with the normal lens on the camera? Or did you, um, or did you use, uh, what, uh, what type of lens was sort of like, kind of like your favorite? Uh, I used like five cameras. You know, I, I had all these cameras strung oh, right. around my neck, <laughs> gotcha. and basically okay. two of them were for, for black and white, and two of them were for color, mm -hmm. and the lenses went from 24 millimeters to 180 millimeters, um, and uh, I just kept interchanging them, and I tried to cover as much <laughs> stuff in color as in black and white, except, you know, working for life in those days, color was not something that was used very much. It, it could appear on a cover, once in a while it would appear on a story, but for the most part, Life Magazine uh, is a black and, was a black and white magazine. But also, you know, you're also dealing with the values of Life Magazine at that time. So I did this story on James Baldwin, and Life laid it out for 12 pages, which was totally unrealistic, because they never were going to get 12 pages to do it that way. Um, but th there was a great uh, editor who really personally was interested in the flow of pictures and all of that. So finally they picked like one picture from this spread and one from that and they were doing it as I think six pages or so. And so they were putting it to bed and the magazine was going to come out and at the last minute they discovered that they, they this was going to start off on a right hand page. Um, with Jimmy, it's a picture of Jimmy and he, he's at a, uh, a pulpit and God is love is you know, the words written on it. And uh, they discovered that there was a <coughs> chocolate pudding ad that was going to be facing it and they held back the story for three weeks. <laughs> right. at, at, at what point did you realize the richness and the power of the photographs that you were creating? Um, 
I don't know now. <laughs> you know, basically, you were. You never realized at that time that these pictures right. would be seen That's or right. would have importance 50 years. You know, we're talking about 50 years ago, and uh, you you never realized any of that. And basically, you were hoping that your pictures would appear in the magazine the next week. You know, when that's that's really where it was at. And photography as an art form, or you know, doing big prints or something like that, was totally an unknown thing at that time. Uh, there was uh, a gallery, a coffee shop in in New York, which started to put little pictures uh, uh, on the wall. Robert Frank's a major photographer and important in, in photography. Um, he had pictures on the wall for $75, which no one was buying, you know, which are worth 250000 maybe today or something like that. But there was no real interest in photography as an art. Uh, I think what you're coming to is a period where um, you have two different kinds of people who collect, who collect uh, painting or, or photography and one is uh, people who really love images and, and really relate to particular images and there are others who realize that you know the valuation of prints, I mean the fine art market is something that you know is escalating uh, rapidly particularly in bigger prints so you, you have that diversity. If you could touch on just a little bit of, you touched on it a, a little bit ago, and you as the photographer, so you didn't go into an assignment thinking, I'm going to tell this story. If my question is really, how did you separate yourself, or did you separate yourself from the story that you were telling through your photographs versus the story that life was telling through how they chose and selected what they were going to put together. Well, life never influenced any stories that I did. In other words, I was never told to, uh, to photograph in a certain way or a particular thing. Basically, they would give me an assignment to go someplace or to photograph some person, and then it was up to me, totally. But you worked with a reporter, which was actually an enormous asset <coughs> in the sense that uh, the reporter could talk to whoever you were dealing with. I mean, not so much in this, which is just a moving, you know, situation. That, you know, we were really on the road, and it's a question of, of looking for images that, that form images. You know, you're looking for an image that is going to stand up as either an iconic type of image or an image which uh, really conveys a situation. You know, I always feel the things that are important uh, in terms of journalistic photography are uh, emotion, design, and information. And all of those are important. For me, emotion is the most important. And, you know, by having a reporter, I could, if I was photographing you, I would be waiting for something either in your eyes or something where I felt, oh, wow, that, that's really special. I mean, basically, um, we all think that we, that we see things exactly like everyone else, and none of us do. We all have a particular point of view, and we don't realize that our point of view is not necessarily the point of view of someone standing right next to you. And in photography, it's a question of just developing that point of view or developing that sense of what you feel, what you personally feel uh, is, a, is a photograph or a moment. Uh, and then doing things that you care about so that you're emotionally involved in what you're doing and it's not something, oh yeah, I gotta do this, or, you know. Um, the other thing is, you know, if, if you do a portrait, uh, that's, that's not really showing anything. You know, I mean, the main thing is looking for something that's very special, either in an attitude that a person has or, you know, or even the design element that, if that isn't happening, to make it into something that will be, you know, a photograph that is interesting or that conveys something of the moment. Um, what, I, what I really didn't do in life, working for life, was <coughs> realizing that uh, what's important in terms of pictures that last is really the dust of times. And uh, you would tend to to do something in terms of an event. In other words, there's a picture, uh, it's a picture in my hero's book uh, of James Baldwin. And uh, 
he's holding an abandoned child, and he's in a room. He's, he, we were in Durham, North Carolina, and it's a room, and there's a big tapestry, big Christ tapestry, and little photographs, you know, on on the dresser there. And you real, I realized I could have taken a picture just of Baldwin, uh, which would have been a good photograph. I could have taken a picture of Baldwin and the child, which would have been a good photograph. But by doing that and putting it into the context of that room, it became a much larger photograph, and a photograph which gave you much more information, feeling, and a sense of, of the times. And I don't think I realized that as much as a journalistic photographer for life as I would today, in terms of thinking of something that, uh, you know, that would be around as a photograph 50 years hence uh, from now, and things like that. Have you embraced digital photography? What? Have you embraced digital photography, or are you? I'm, I'm, I have a book uh, which comes out next year uh, called Bliss, which is about the hippie movement today, as differentiated from the hippie movement <coughs> in the 60s, which has gone away from uh, heavy drugs and gone into meditation and, um, you know, and dancing, uh, ecstatic dancing, and uh, organic food and all of that. And it's like a joyous book, and uh, it's called Bliss. It'll be out in a year, you know. So that's totally digital uh, and totally in color. And there's also another uh, series of pictures I'm doing on a place in Chicago called Misery, Misericordia, which is really for uh, people with developmental problems. And uh, it's a community of 600 people, 600 residents, and... Uh, Sister Rosemary, uh, a nun, uh, really over 40 years has developed this into something which is now a 35-acre uh, area in Chicago, in the middle of Chicago, which looks like a scene set from MGM uh, of a perfect village. All these houses are, are great, and it's an amazing place because <coughs> people who... Uh, maybe spent 10 years of their life just staring at a television set or doing nothing, suddenly are in a program where every moment is filled with activity and where suddenly everyone is just totally joyous. You walk in a room <coughs> and um, immediately someone will look at you with a smile and say, what's your name? And they'll hold out their hand to shake your hand and they'll give you their name. And, you know, uh, it's an amazing place and... Uh, I'm doing a story on that, hmm. doing a book on that. Do you that. wish you had digital in those days? Um, no, there was no what, digital. I know. <laughs> no, there, there was no digital. So you have probably two or three frames um, now? Or there's those? a big difference between black and white photography and mm -hmm. color photography. I always feel that black and white is more emotional. Um, but with a color photograph, if, if you do a picture and you... You know, there's a relationship between two people that you're doing, and someone in a yellow slicker or a red jacket walks behind. When you see that picture uh, in color, uh, your eye is going to go right to that and not to the people. Uh, so there's a totally different palette to work with in color <coughs> and in black and white. And you have to think differently in terms of how you photograph in those, those two different ways. Yep. In the uh, pressure cooker of this story, did you develop like a professional kinship with other photographers who were on the march? Yeah. 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 We knew each other and we saw each other and all. <laughs> you know, there there also was this competitive spirit also. Sure. You know, in which uh, I mean, the best story I can tell you is. Um, uh, Jack Kennedy, Jack and Jackie Kennedy were at the Washington airport and the Shah of Iran was arriving. And this was 1963. And most of the photographers, this is in Washington, most of the photographers used uh, were newspaper photographers and they had big cameras and they had these flash bulbs which you take one, one flash and you throw <coughs> the bulb away and you have to put in another thing. And they had set up the photo op for where Jackie was standing was going to be so maybe from the distance from that picture to where I am now. So this was a very competitive time for magazines and newspapers and all of that. So all these photographers are like jostling themselves, jostling 
And um, I came late. I was not a Washington photographer. Uh, and, uh, you know, the line's very full. And because of my great height, what I did was I crawled under everyone's legs. <laughs> and people were hitting on me from all different sides. But I got a really nice picture, you know, from low angle. Uh, but what impressed me about Jackie Kennedy was that uh, the photographers are right here, and never once did she look at the photographers, and so she was always into her own thoughts, uh, and flashbulbs are flashing and all of that, and she never once looked there. And so, in a sense, she was creating her own charisma, because when you see the picture, you wonder, what's he thinking? <laughs> uh, and it's a subtle thing, you know. The other thing that's interesting about photography is um, you, you sense the photographer's involvement, or you, you sense things, uh, there's a difference in how you look at a photograph which has direct flash, and a photograph which subtly brings out a room, but, but doesn't have that feeling. There, there's something, when you see the direct flash, you feel the involvement of the photographer, or the particip participation of the photographer. Uh, I worked a lot with bound strobe, and the bound strobe sort of just brought enough light into everything, but you were never aware, you never think of me as being there. Yeah? Uh, I thought it was very interesting, the uh, photograph that we've probably seen some places before, a few hours after mm -hmm. Kennedy, um, after King's death in the room, we spoke to, to me a little bit about it last night, but that's just amazing, you said there were two other photographers there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they took what you took. No. And um, what's so amazing is the left room, the um, already the announcement on the television of his death, and then mm -hmm. the open suitcase, his book, The Strength to Love. Mm -hmm. That's just really amazing. Can you talk at all about that um, experience? When, uh, when Dr. King was shot, um, I got a call immediately from Life Magazine. I was in New York and they said go to Memphis immediately. <coughs> and I went to Memphis and um, uh, Dr. King had not survived. Um, I went to the rooming house from which the shots were fired first uh, and from a um, third story bathroom the assailant had, had stood in the bathtub and leveled his gun on the window, which had a clear view of the Lorraine Motel. And, uh, you know, and the shot was fired there. And I noticed that there was a dirty handprint on the wall, which could only have been made by someone standing in the bathtub. And I, I surmised that this was from the assailant. Uh, Life published a full page picture of that handprint the next week. But, uh, so I photographed that room and then uh, I went to the motel and um, uh, knocked on the door and Jose Williams, who was one of uh, Dr. King's aides, uh, asked who it was and was letting me in. There were two photographers and uh, one of them said, don't let that little guy in here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he didn't use a different word. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I photographed, uh, I saw his attache case on a ledge, and I saw these dirty shirts and styrofoam cups spread there, and uh, I saw his image come up on the television set, and I photographed all of it and became important to me in the sense that it meant to me that the physical man was gone forever, his material things remained, uh, but his spirit, you know, still lingered and still came out at us. Um, so, 37 years later, which is just a few years ago, I went back to Memphis for the first time. And I went to the boarding house and they had turned it into a museum. And they had the white car that the assailant apparently had. They had these videos, or they had, they had taken all the rooms out, so it was just bare brick walls. But they had taken this bathroom and they had pushed it out so that flush with the brick walls there was just a styro just a plastic, you know, a plastic wall so you could look in on this bathroom. Uh, but 
the wall which had the handprint had been replaced with just a blank piece of, of uh, you know, of uh, board. And then I went to the motel and they again had done a, uh, a plastic wall so that you could see into the motel room, but it was the wall that I had been shooting against, the, the wall where the television had been on and where uh, his attaché case was beyond. So basically, it was very strange for me because the two things which were most emotional at the time for me no longer existed. And yet this was now a national muse museum, in a way, a historical museum. Um, which, you know, it's sort of emblematic of, of a lot of stuff, I don't know. But uh, it, it, really, uh, it really made an impression upon me. Do you prefer uh, shooting in black and white or color? Um, I prefer shooting in black and white, but these last two books I've done, or that I'm doing, are in color. Uh, uh, I guess, for one thing, it's much cheaper to do. Um, and also, in terms of the subjects, the, the, the two books I'm doing now really involve a lot of color, and, and the color is sort of part of the joy of these books in a way, so that I feel the books are more joyous in a certain sense because of it. Um, if it was just a purely emotional situation, uh, I might, you know, I might, I, I do want to go back to black and white, and, you know, uh, again, I feel black and white pictures are stronger. The other thing is that in terms of film, hey, 50 years later, I still have all this film. <laughs> Digital is tricky, you know, as to whether you're going to be able to, 50 years from now, find all your digital images in a way, and in what form they're going to be, and, uh, you know, whether there's deterioration or, or what. Thank you. That's true. Well, I want to thank Steve for coming. If anyone has any questions, I just want to keep it moving so if people have things to do this afternoon, please feel free, and let's thank Steve for being here today. <laughs>